have your Bibles with you this evening, open with me to 1 John, the first epistle of John. We're going to be in chapter uh, th 3 this evening. 1 John chapter 3. It's great to have you all out this evening. Good way to start the year. Establish faithfulness and uh, be a part of what we're doing. Amen. New year, new backdrop. Hallelujah. For those of you who don't know what Maranatha means, it's an Aramaic word that literally is a prayer and an answer to prayer, both at the same time. It means, O oh Lord, come, and it means the Lord is coming. And so it's the fulfillment of its own desire, Maranatha. And this is the way the first century Christians greeted each other. The, the early church, as you are well aware, was largely Jewish, and the Jews would greet one another with shalom. But the Christians uh, were suffering under enormous persecution, and they knew shalom, which means peace, wasn't coming in the near future. But they had the hope. They had the hope that Jesus was coming. And that's how they greeted one another. Rather than shalom, they greeted one another with Maranatha. And I want to think about the hope of Maranatha with you this evening. And uh, many of you are well aware that that I believe that there's great potential for Jesus to come back this year. We don't know. We can't pin a date or a time on that. That's God's discretion. and uh, We're not preempting that. But Jesus is coming. Whether he comes in 2023 or 2033, he's coming. He's coming. And, and the way things are going and the way this world is spinning right now, we know that his coming is at hand. And that is a, a, an amazing thought that carries with it an enormous revelation of things that are happening in our own lives right now. And I want to think about that with you out of 1 John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 2 and 3 together. John writes, Dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word and I pray you'll anoint it. I pray you'll lay hold of every heart and mind in this building. We will be a people that are truly concerned about what you want to do in our internal man, what you want to do in us to prepare us for that day when we stand before you in glory and worship and praise. We know that day is coming. We're asking God that you help us tonight. You give us direction, you give us clarity, you challenge our hearts. If there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know you, that doesn't have that intimate relationship that can only be had by being born again. I'm asking that you will bring that revelation to hearts and minds and people will leave this place tonight different than the way they came in, saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. I pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the pinnacle texts in the New Testament. If you sit and you ponder just those two verses, uh, so many different thoughts and implications uh, come to mind, and there's no way that we can cover it all. Uh, we're just going to touch on a couple of high points, uh, uh, but I would encourage your ongoing uh, thinking about, pondering, meditating on this text, because if you'll do so, you, it, it opens up Vast ideas and uh, possibilities that are suggested by these two verses. The overarching concept is our sanctification, the renewal, the transformation of what we are. It has to do with the lifetime pursuit of Christ likeness. And the truth of the matter is, the entire first epistle of John 
is dealing with that. It's dealing with sanctification. It's dealing with the sin issues that we face and, and are challenged by. And there's a, a great deal in the epistle of John dealing with this very issue. But I'm going to zero in on one specific aspect of sanctification, one essential aspect, and that is in our text. It is the assurance that we will attain it in eternity. How many of you ever get vexed at yourself? How many of you ever get up in the morning, look in the mirror and go, you again? <laughs> right? And we're dealing with who we are all the time. And uh, there are things that go on in all of our internal man that nobody knows about, that we're fighting with individually. And the longing of our heart is that God would change us and transform us and do a supernatural work in our lives. And then that tends to spread out and we start hoping for that in everyone around us as well. And the truth of the matter is there is a promise in this text that we're going there. We're getting there. He says now we are the children of God. Don't mistake that. Be aware of the fact that even with your flaws and even with the things that you are wrestling with in your character, in your nature, in your spirit, in your mind, uh, even though those things exist, uh, we are indeed children of God. We, we are part of the family. We're in with God and in his grace. But we are imperfectly experiencing that reality in our lives. Paul was probably one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, if you can say that about anyone. He was, he was very much a consecrated individual, and yet he wrote of the hunger, the ongoing desire to see what he had not yet seen. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 to 12, he says that his desire was to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, the language that he's using of self death and resurrection, uh, I believe, are spiritual statements because he's talking about not having attained it yet. So he's not talking about his physical death, although. That was very much in the hearts of the first century church. Many of them really thought that the ultimate Christian expression was martyrdom. And they weren't afraid of that. They wanted to show the world Christ in whatever way that they could. And if that was martyrdom, so be it. Now, I don't think Paul is talking about a death wish here. I don't think he's talking about his martyrdom. He's talking about the reality that followers of Christ are to take up their own cross and follow him. And that means... Uh, that we die to self. And, and if we will die to ourselves, we will resurrect in Christ. This is what baptism is all about. And so this is Paul's hunger. This is what he longs for, is to step into this. This is his boldest aspiration, is I don't want my own righteousness. I want God's righteousness. And I don't want that just to be positional. I don't want that to just be theological. I want to live it. I want to know it. I want to know Christ intimately. I want to know what it's like to walk in that complete and total surrender to God. And then he says, but I haven't attained it. Now here's a man sold out to Jesus, and yet he's in the same place we all are. Is I am totally given to God, but I have a whole lot of, a whole lot of ground to cover yet. I have a whole lot I have yet to experience I'm reaching for. I want this experience in God. I want to know the power of his resurrection. John says, 
we're children of God, undeniably, but we're not there yet. I have not yet attained it. Everything that I will be, I'm not yet. I'm still working on this. This is what sanctification is all about. James 3, 2 says we all stumble in many ways. This is James, the, the man whose emphasis is works and doing the right thing. And yet he says we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So he just picks out one arena of human struggle, our mouth. How many of you have a problem with your mouth? If any of you right now are thinking, well, man, I can't think of, of any way that I sinned this week, just think about some of the things you said. <laughs> just think about some of the things you said about one another. Maybe some things you said to your wife, said to your husband, some things you said about your boss. Just think about your mouth. And it won't take long before you're blushing. And you're realizing, man, I've got some, some work to do. I've got some things that still have to change in my life. The psalmist speaks of this in the 119th Psalm. The psalm extols the, the wonders of God's commands and, and uh, his purposes and his will. It's a tremendous psalm, but it's, it's, uh, it's almost over the top. Sometimes when I read it, I think, man... How do you get into that state of mind? But listen very carefully to what he says here. Uh, it's a long psalm. And in the 173rd verse, he says, uh, May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord, uh, and your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your laws sustain me, I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. So here's a man that is wrapped by the righteousness of God, by the, by the lifestyle that God is calling us to. He's enamored with it. He loves it. He loves the idea. He loves the idea of never saying the wrong thing, never thinking the wrong thing, never doing the wrong thing, a life of genuine righteousness. And he's, he's uh, talking about how wonderful it is. And then he says, but I'm, I'm like a lost sheep. I'm, I'm not there. I haven't forgotten what you require of me, but I'm not there and I need your help. And that's the way we live as Christians. But here's the glorious reality of our text. Despite the challenges and the failures that we face, we know that when we see him, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is, without any impediment to our vision of the glory of God without any misunderstanding of who he is and how much he loves us and how powerful he is. All of the barriers and all of the things that keep us from experiencing God in his fullness are removed. When we see him, we'll see him as he is. And he talks about we'll be like him, we'll be transformed. And there are some commentators, Kenneth Wiest, uh, he's very strong on the idea of this is talking about the transformation of our bodies. But I believe it goes much further than that. Because the problem with us is our flesh, right? The problem with us is our fallen nature. And when we see him, the Bible makes it very, very clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that the flesh goes by, that we're done with it, that it's no longer an issue. And that makes perfect sense because we can't bring our flesh with us into heaven. We can't bring this hotbed of deceit, this hotbed of error, and this hotbed of sin. We can't bring that with us. That's, and, and we wouldn't want to. We wouldn't want to. Amen? I don't want the stores in heaven being ripped off by mass mobs. Amen? I don't want to have to worry about whether you're lying to me or not in heaven. 
I don't have to worry about a car salesman in heaven. I don't have to worry about all the jive politicians in heaven. Because there won't be any. If they don't get saved, there won't be any. <laughs> Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. If you don't get right with God, you won't be there. And so, I don't want sin in heaven. I want an eternity where the holiness and the grace of God prevail. And this is exactly what our text is speaking to. It's not just a physical transformation when we get into heaven. It is the conforming of our character to the Christ nature. Right now, I am trying to put on Christ. There, I will be in Christ. That's where we'll dwell. And we will experience, for the first time in our lives, absolute sinlessness. And that whets my appetite. I want that. Amen. I want that for me, and I want that for you. Paul speaks about it again and again. 1 Corinthians 13, 10 to 12. It says, but when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, uh, I put the, the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. This is the same thought that John is having. Right now, I don't know everything and all the implications of this uninterrupted fellowship with the living God. But when I see him, when I get there, right now it's just like looking in a mirror. It's a dim glass is actually the thought behind it. Right now it's just a, it's kind of a warped reflection. But when I get there, when it's all said and done, then I'll fully know him and I will be fully known. Romans 8, 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So this constantly feeds into the uh, apostolic thought. It feeds into Christian thought. Is that right now, I am absolutely a child of God, but I'm not where I need to be. And I'm not enjoying everything that I'm going to enjoy at his coming. Right? Right? So there's more about his coming than just we get to get out of here. We get to get, get out of here and we get to shed our skins. Amen. We get to leave this thing that we are by nature behind. And our ultimate sanctification is a done deal. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 in the uh, ESV says, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And that is where we're heading in Christ. So, that's the, that's the background. That's the reality of, of Maranatha. That's the hope, is that we get, to, we get to step into the life that God intended for creation. We get to step into the experience of God in all of its fullness without any distance, without any separation, completely engaged with God. So given all of this, the trajectory of the Christian life towards Christ-likeness, ultimate righteousness that we all long for, everybody in here who is a Christian is hungry for this. We hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus talked about people who hunger and thirst for this. I want to live a life of integrity. I want to live a life that matches my ideals and the longings for righteousness that dwell in me. This is our hope. This is the hope of Maranatha. This is what we are looking forward to. A sinless eternity in Christ. If that's true, then it makes sense that right now we would be in hot pursuit of that very purity. 
If that's what I want to be in eternity, then that's what I want to be now. If that's what I think my destiny is, is to be a righteous creature, then why would I want to be something less now? Why would I be happy to just go on playing in the pig pen when I know I'm heading towards a mansion? Why would I want to continue to entertain all of the things of my flesh that are, that are just wrong? That's all you can say. They're sin. They're wrong. Why would I want to dwell there when my greatest hope is to step into the presence of God and all of this sheds away? Why wouldn't I Seek purity. Right here, right now. Why wouldn't I want to enter into this dynamic here and now? That's the expression of a hunger for a destiny that we know is coming. I want to become what I was meant to be. That's why we always feel sideways. It's because we're not what we're meant to be. That's why you'll never feel at home in your own skin until Christ dwells there with you. Amen. You'll always feel like something's off. Like you got this low-grade fever, and it's always there, and it's never right. There's always something that's messing with it, messing with your peace, messing with your sense of uh, all is well with my soul. You'll never have that experience uh, until you're right with Christ. And then once you have a taste of that, that begins to drive you. I want more of this. I want more of the experience of Christ, of his death, of his suffering, of his resurrection, of the power. I want this in my life because that is what God created me to be. Right? It only makes sense. You know, if your destiny was to become the next Michael Jordan, you would spend your entire life out on the court practicing your three-pointer. Right? I'm going to be the next Michael Jordan. Now, you know full well that's not just going to happen. You're going to have to go out and throw some basketballs. But, but this is where I'm heading. Uh, and, and people are driven this way. They want to be the next great in their given pursuit. If you thought you were going to be the next Whitney Houston, you would be strengthening your intercoastals <laughs> and practicing your hear, sing, and hum. Right? I mean, you'd be all in. You'd be all in. Why? Because this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to attain something. It's that desire to attain that fuels effort. Right? We're not going to pursue something we have no hope of getting. But we will pursue something that we believe we're destined for. And it's the goal of our life. You give yourself to it. It's the hope of attainment that fuels the fire of effort and commitment. And for a Christian, this is definitive. For a Christian, it's all about entering into the kingdom of God and experiencing this incredible thing that God created us for. And this is what drove Paul, going back to Philippians 3, where he's talking about how he wants to experience all this, but he hasn't attained it yet. He says this in uh, the preceding verse, in verse 8 in the New Century Version. says, not only those things, but I think uh, that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have lost all those things, and now I know they are worthless trash. This allows me to have Christ. So here's Paul. He's saying, what's driving me? What's compelling me? The reason why I'm reaching for this experience in Christ uh, is because it's the only thing I want. It's my, it's, it's my core being. Everything else is non-essential. Everything else I count as trash because I'm reaching for something. This is all I want. Is I want Jesus in all his glory. Living in my heart. I want to be able to love the way Jesus loves. I want to be able to care. I don't, I don't like my cynicism. I don't like my attitude. 
I want to be like Jesus, who's able to look his enemy in the eye and say, Father, forgive him. I don't want to walk around bitter, angry, grumpy, deadly. I want to be like Jesus. And Paul says, in order to have that, I'm shedding everything else. I only want that. And the future hope, Maranatha, he is coming. That hope, ultimately, is all that matters. So this brings our own personal spiritual ambitions into question. What compels you? What do you really want to attain in this life? Considering that you're going to be leaving it. Stepping into eternity. What do you want to take with you? What, what's important here and now? Amen? Amen? In the end, what matters? What difference will it make how much money you had? What difference will it make what your career was? None of that mean anything. You can spend your whole life being a helicopter mom, hovering over your children, protecting them from all of their struggles in life, and it won't mean a thing in eternity. What are you going to be when you step into eternity? Are you going to be the greatest civil engineer that ever existed? Are you going to rearrange the streets of gold? Are you going to be the superlative day trader? The smartest academic in heaven? The greatest cook? Will any of that matter in eternity? These are things that we give our whole life to. I want to be the greatest fill in the blank. How does that transition into your eternal destiny? Right? I try very hard to be a great preacher. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be out of a job. They aren't going to need any preachers in heaven. Right? So I can study and I can, I can dig in and I do so, but at the end of the day, that's not what's important. All of our earthly responsibilities, we should give ourselves to. We should give ourselves to the pursuit of excellence, but for what end? For what reason? Why do I want to be a great preacher? Because I want to feed the sheep and I want to glorify God. Not because I want to be remembered as the great preacher. Right? It doesn't matter what your vocation is. You should strive for excellence, but you should do so for the right reason, which is that God is glorified by the way that you live. And your example is a demonstration of where you're going. This is what drives me. What drives me is I'm on my way to heaven. What drives me is I'm going to be in the presence of God. He's not going to be impressed with my knowledge of the Greek. Amen. I'm not even impressed with my knowledge of the Greek. He's not going to be impressed with my abilities, organizational skills, which are non-existent. <laughs> Whatever it may be, beloved, you gotta, you got to narrow things down. What are you hoping for in eternity? Because what you're hoping for now will have a great bearing on how you're living. And if what I'm hoping for is Christ-likeness, then that's what I'm going to be laboring to attain. That's what I'm going to be giving myself to. My hope in the transformation that is mine at his appearing produces a corresponding pursuit of purity here and now. I want to be pure, not because I expect to be perfect in this life, but I want to be pure because I expect to be perfect in eternity. That's compelling. 
That is compelling. Anyone who has dug deep into their spiritual being, anyone who has ever looked at their own soul has said, oh God, I need a miracle. What a mess. Amen? It's like your basement. And none of you have basements. You don't do basements out in the Southwest. I grew up in basements. You know what basements were? Basements is where you threw everything that you're not using. I would say that the allegory to it in the Southwest is your garage. And everything goes out in the garage that you're not going to use in the near future. And pretty soon your garage is this complete mess. You've got animals living in there. I, I went in uh, last spring to my garage and I found a whole family of mice living in my shop vac. See, we all got that mess inside of us. That's what I want to fix here and now. That's what I want to work on. I want to clean up my mess. That's what purifying is. I want to clean up my mess. Why? Because that's what I'm hoping for. I'm looking forward to a heaven where everything is just cool. Because I'm tired of a planet where nothing is cool. And so that informs the way I think and the way I live. Our text, Titus chapter 2, that's up here on our backdrop. We only have the concluding thought, but listen to the entire context. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What are we doing while we wait for the blessed hope? We are learning how to be self-controlled, godly, righteous people. We're learning how to love our enemies. We're learning how to be liberal, not to be dominated by money. We're learning how to pray and build a relationship with God. We're learning how to be pure. Right? Your Christianity isn't just a free ride into heaven. Your Christianity changes you. It changes your desire. It changes what drives you. There is nothing worse than Christians who have no spiritual ambition to be godly. That have no interest in holiness. That never want to deal with the issues of your life. Right? Come on. Don't look at me like a bunch of stained glass saints. His coming affects us. And it affects us here and now. What is to be our preoccupation while we wait for the blessed hope? Upright and godly lives. So here we are, turn of the year. New theme on the back wall. Doesn't replace the old one. We're still concerned about going into all the world and making disciples. But I believe it is particularly important that we keep his imminent return all the more in focus this year because that will drive the way we live. Brother Bakke, throughout various Sunday schools, has been notorious for asking the same question. It com comes up in various discussions, and it's, it runs something along these lines. So uh, I'm a Christian. And I'm living for God. And then I mess up and I go into a bar and I have a couple of drinks. And then I step out and I get run over by a bus. Am I going to heaven? And I hope Sam never does that. And I hope Sam never gets run over by a bus. But that's the kind of question that arises in the hearts of men and women who know what they're capable of. Sam's not planning on going tying one on. 
But he knows what he's capable of. I know what I'm capable of. And believe me, I know what you're capable of. And I want to tame that beast. And I want to keep that beast at bay. And I'm interested in how I'm living because at any moment, I could find myself standing before Christ. At any moment. The Bible says when he comes back, it's going to be the twinkling of an eye. How much time do you think you're going to have to repent in the twinkling of an eye? Wait, 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 wait. I got, I, man, I got, to, I got to get right with you. At which point God's going to say, it's a little late for that. You should have been thinking about that before I showed up. Because we who have this hope purify ourselves. We take care of the business of our inner landscape. Pastor Looney preached recently about God bringing his candle into our dark places. Peering. <laughs> what you got in here? Don't go in there. Oh no, that's exactly where I need to go. Let me, move aside, son, move aside. I need to shine my candle. Right? What, where do you not want God poking his nose? Pastor Smart preached about uh, the weights that hinder us, the things that keep us from running the race, and how we need to shed those things because they're, they're hindering us, they're slowing us down, they're stopping us from attaining what we want to attain. I am preaching on the purifying of yourself. God is saying something to us for good reason. He's saying, look, I'm coming back for a spotless bride. I'm coming back for a bride who cares what she looks like. Would it be terrible on the day of your marriage? You show up, you got your tux on, you're all set, you're looking good, you're smelling good, you've combed your hair for the first time in a year, you're looking like, man, this guy's ready to get married, and in walks your wife-to-be, and she's got her bowling shirt on. She's got her torn-up jeans, you know, the way everybody wears their jeans today. Can't you afford jeans with out holes? You know, when my jeans went that way, my, my mommy and daddy would buy me new jeans. You got a hole in your knee. You need new jeans. Or actually, what she really did, she had this, uh, this thing that she would iron on to the backside of the pant, right? So, so you'd have this big hole with this little blue jean patch showing through. Because <laughs> we couldn't afford new jeans. But the, the bottom line is, uh, I don't even know how I got off on that. I, I just... <laughs> started thinking about this is your bride to be she comes slumming in she's got her she's got her slippers on why do you wear your slippers in public those are for your bedroom you got these big fluffy slippers going on it's like what is that put some shoes on girl here comes your wife to be hey honey <laughs> I'm here. How about a kiss? If, if you were wise, young man, the exit's over there. And you would be running for your life. Christ isn't coming for you, slumming through your Christianity. He's coming for a pure bride, a spotless bride. People who care about their inner landscape, who care about the way they think, what they do with their lives, how they conduct themselves. When we have this hope, we purify ourselves. I can't think of a better way to start off this year and to process what I'm preaching about than a season of prayer and fasting. You know, I was thinking about it. Fasting actually is a purification. It, it, doctors tell us that fasting is very healthy, that it's, it's a detoxification. It gets rid of things in your body that have been building up. And they recommend, for no spiritual reason at all, that you fast regularly to purify your body, right? Well, we're not so much doing this to purify our body. The problem with most of us is we'll lose six pounds on the fast and we'll gain it all back the next day. And so we're not doing this for health reasons per se. 
But I would like to get rid of some of the spiritual toxins. I would like very much for God to do something inside of me. And that's why I pray. And that's why I fast. It's because I'm looking for God to help me with this process of sanctification. Amen. What a great way to begin the year. A time of crying out to God and having this pressure in us to consecrate and do what's right before God, spoken to by the Spirit of grace. If we let his coming pull us into him this year, the awareness that he could easily appear, then this year could be the first year of change in your life in a long time, especially older Christians. You know what happens with older Christians is you get comfortable. You know, you've been doing it for a while and you've, you've accepted the fact that, hey, you know, I'm, I haven't done so well in this area and, and so I'm just going to live with it. You should never live with the unlivable. You should never accept the unacceptable. You should be concerned enough to let that stuff drive you to cry out to God. Israel was waiting for the first return of their or for the first coming of their Messiah. And when he came, it changed everything. We're waiting for the second coming of the Messiah. And when he comes, it's going to change everything. Absolutely. We should be in the process of that even now. Maranatha. When we see him, we will be like him. What a, what a day of rejoicing that will be. I want every head bowed, every eye